My name is Anne O'Sullivan. I'm a British Heart Foundation arrhythmia nurse specialist. I work in Lewisham Hospital, which is in London, England. I work in a secondary care hospital. That means from a cardiology perspective, we don't have consultant electrophysiologists um, managing our arrhythmia patients in this hospital and neither do we have a catheter lab um, to perform procedures such as catheter ablation. They have to be referred to our local tertiary centre. And we're talking today Anne, about atrial fibrillation or AF. Mm -hmm. Can you just um, define what it is sort of in simplistic terms and why it's so significant as an arrhythmia? Uh, atrial fibrillation, it is the most common sustained arrhythmia we have in the Western world. Um, it results in uncoordinated electrical activity up in the atria and from a clinical perspective uh, we know we suspect a patient has atrial fibrillation if we feel their pulse and it's irregular it should raise a clinical suspicion especially if the patient is older uh, it can occur in patients of all ages however it does tend to be associated more with patients who are elderly and that's quite important because we are living a lot longer we're an aging population, so at the moment prevalence is 1-2%, to but we're expecting this may actually be doubled in the next 50 years or so. And what's, so what, what's, what's the worry about that? Well, there's, there's, something to do with, to, uh, there's a stroke risk, yeah, isn't there, with this? It is really important because um, stroke is, um, atrial fibrillation, sorry, is one of the most important contributors to stroke. And unfortunately, uh, when patients have a stroke due to atrial fibrillation, it also tends to be much more severe and they tend to have much more disabling symptoms. It leads to um, many more hospitalizations. Mm. Uh, for some patients, it can um, really affect the quality of their life, uh, both in physical symptoms and actually in mood. Without having a stroke? Without having without a stroke. Without having the condition itself, even yes. if you don't have a stroke? Even without a stroke, yeah. uh, additional symptoms. Right. Thanks to the clarification, yeah. additional yeah. symptoms can include uh, just increased hospitalizations mm. due to fear and anxiety when they experience palpitations. Um, it's hard for patients to know what's going on. All they can feel is their heart is beating mm. and it scares them. So they'll present to hospital uh, to the A&E and we subsequently can admit a lot more. Uh, quality of life, uh, it can reduce their exercise tolerance. It can lead to um, lethargy. Um, it can also lead to, in some cases, um, increased risk of heart failure. And that's often due to patients having an uncontrolled fast atrial fibrillation for a length of time and late diagnosis, so it's damaged the muscle of the heart. So your role, and um, because you were saying the British Heart Foundation, uh, for those who don't know, that's a major charity yeah. in the UK. Yeah. How did they become involved with this? What's, what's the trigger for them? Because your post is funded yeah, by Yeah, very much so. Um, way back in 2005, 2006, we have a, um, a Department of Health um, publication, which was the National Service Framework, and they added an extra chapter uh, that which, year, that yeah, year yeah. which um, related specifically to arrhythmias. All the previous chapters were very much for um, CHD or um, chronic heart disease generally. And part of the requirements from the National Service Framework was that um, patients with arrhythmias um, should have earlier and prompt diagnosis and also they should have a lot more patient support. So accurate information, feel uh, increased knowledge more control over their condition. Uh, the British Heart Foundation subsequently then provided funding for actually up to 32 arrhythmia nurse specialists for slash arrhythmia care coordinators uh, across England and Wales and they provided funding for three years and then thankfully the majority of the trust be it in the community or in the hospital base the majority have actually taken up the funding once those three years have been, um, been completed. So what uh, which we're beyond the three years, aren't we? So yes, we are. So here. my funding has you're been continued, here, yeah. yeah. Um, so what is the role that you do? Um, because there'll be people all around the world mm -hmm. interested in how f advanced your practice is, etc. You run a clinic and you see patients with AF. Yeah, so part of my role, uh, when we're talking about specifically atrial fibrillation uh, patients, is about a year and a half ago we set up a designated clinic 
which is nurse-led for atrial fibrillation patients. Uh, the main reason for doing this is that because we don't have a consultant electrophysiologist within this trust, these patients were being referred to general cardiologists, which is absolutely fine. However, appointments, initial appointments, were taking anything from two to three months for first consultation. And, you know, there is evidence that the earlier we diagnose a patient with atrial fibrillation, more importantly, the earlier we can put them on appropriate medication and hopefully prevent something drastic such as a stroke. So, um, that was the main reason initially we set up the atrial fibrillation clinic to reduce the waiting times uh, to provide the patients with a point of contact mm. and we are different from doctors we do have different skills even though it is a diagnostic clinic you know our training is very much based on developing a, a, a relationship with the patient uh, we're lucky as far as the clinic times tend to be longer I'm quite lucky each clinic slot uh, is about 40 minutes in duration, so that allows for time for getting a clinic history, doing a physical examination, uh, providing appropriate education, and then making sure they have my contact details and a follow-up um, telephone link so they can actually contact me via um, telephone or email should they have further questions once consultation has finished. That was one of my questions was yeah. whether you're dealing with initial diagnosis. Mm -hmm. So who's referring to you? It's a community doctor, what we would know as a GP, mm -hmm. I presume. Do they refer direct to the nurse or is there an, another medic in the hospital in between? A mixture. The general practitioners uh, in the community are allowed to um, refer directly into the service. Because they're looking for a diagnosis? Yes. Right. Uh, some of them... Uh, it depends actually. Some of them have a, a high suspicion. Uh, some of the GPs have actually confirmed the diagnosis because they have sent the patients for a 12 lead ECG but no um, initial treatment has been initiated. Mm -hmm. So it's not always initial diagnosis but I have had cases where there's a high suspicion and we all do, especially for patients with paroxysmal. So they give a very good history that the patient is likely to be in atrial fibrillation but unfortunately when the 12 lead ECG was recorded the patient had reverted back to sinus. Mm -hmm. So these patients they've often referred in to the system to give um, to see if we can order other tests that which may be more appropriate to elicit a diagnosis if possible. Uh, I also take referrals though from the um, general physicians in this hospital. I tend to get a few uh, referrals from patients, the, the physicians who look after stroke patients. Right. So they've been admitted with a suspected TIA or unfortunately a, a major stroke and um, they will link them into my service mm. as well. And also um, patients from the general cardiologist. Mm. Sometimes a patient will be referred into the consultant cardiologist and luckily now I've worked with the consultants here for a few years. They know about the clinic, they know what my capabilities are mm. and if they see a patient with atrial fibrillation and they think okay this patient can be seen earlier, let's transfer it straight across to the nurse-led atrial fibrillation clinic. So at what point do you let them go, Anne? Because surely it's a chronic condition that mm -hmm. needs to be managed in the community. Mm -hmm. uh, do you see them for a short period of time and then the community takes over managing them? And, or, or do you hang on to those that are a bit trickier? Because yeah, otherwise it, your list will go up and up and up. Yeah, it, it, it does vary. Um, there is a certain group of patients, uh, let's say a younger or a first presentation, they come in with atrial fibrillation, they're symptomatic, and it's persistent in nature so it's lasted for longer than seven days and um, because they're uncomfortable with the rhythm because it has slowed them down they they do not feel well we offer them an opportunity for rhythm control so the service as part of providing um, early diagnosis and patient support it's also a very good clinic for facilitating a rapid rhythm control treatment with DC cardioversion direct right. current cardioversion that day no no not quite that good yeah. um, no it, but it refers them into the system so we can ensure that the warfarin is started within the week and that I don't have to wait what happened before was a patient would be referred to a cardiologist, uh, they would see this, then discuss a rhythm control, then the referral would come to me, then they would be waiting for another few weeks. So 
and then eventually I get them onto the D, the direct current cardioversion waiting list. So it has cut out probably for that group of patients, it's cut out a waiting time of probably maybe you know six to eight weeks at least. Mm. Uh, those patients will be seen, they'll be prepped, but I will always follow them up after the cardioversion as well. Do you do the cardioversion? I do. Right, okay. so, with, with an anaesthetist. Oh yes, yeah, oh, yes. Yeah, uh, yeah so um, generally the patients are aware that it's a nurse-led service. Uh, nurse coordinated, I sometimes think is a better word, mm -hmm. because you've got the consultant anaesthetist, you've got me and you've got an ODA, and ideally you do need three people to make everything run nice and smoothly. Mm -hmm. um, it, if I, when I'm on annual leave, unfortunately at the moment, Due to um, staff restrictions and not having enough nurse specialists, the service has to be covered by the cardiology registrars. In the ideal world, that would be covered by another nurse specialist, but it does take time to, for them to be released from their duties to get trained up and to be deemed competent as well. So where do you do that? Because you have to recover these patients. Uh, that's yeah. very good support. I mean, yeah. to have a service like that, uh, you do need everything else to be in place. and. Um, the patients are pre-assessed in the daycare unit initially, they're taken to theatre, they're recovered in the theatre recovery probably for about 20 minutes or so, that's generally it, and then they go back down to the wards where they, um, they continue to be monitored for another hour or so. I will review all the patients uh, following prior to the discharge, but you have got good nursing support that do post you know, um, anaesthetic care much better than I do. It is not my background, mm -hmm. and I will just see them from an arrhythmia perspective and discharge with a, um, a summary and suggestions for any medication review back to the GP. Right. Um, uh, just thinking a little bit about you talked about rhythm control. Mm -hmm. You would run a service on rate control as well, for maybe with the yeah, with a with atrial fibrillation. I think, especially with the new guidelines, the European Society of Cardiology's guidelines last year were updated in 2010, and um, it, it's still stated clearly that you know when it comes to these patients, safety is the first priority, and beta blockers, um, which are used for rate control, are still first line. So any patient that comes into the clinic, 99% um, are offered a straightforward rate control strategy as initial treatment. Even those patients that are waiting for a cardioversion, we need to control their rate first, and some patients, that it's all they need to control their symptoms. But especially in the younger patients, they still feel that despite their heart rate being well controlled, they still want the second option of trying to get back to a normal rhythm in conjunction with that. So you have to give them the opportunity to see if it improves their clinical symptoms. Um, you're not a nurse prescriber, but that's no, something, I'm not. I mean, that's something you're going to do, you were saying. Yeah, okay, yeah. Then, Within yeah. the next six months, I'm starting the is, course. Is that going to markedly change the service? You think? Um, it will help from rate control point of view. Uh, often I have patients that have come to the clinic and the GPs, you know, they've been excellent, they've done all the initiation of therapy, but when they come to me I still find, despite the treatment they're on, um, their rate is not adequately controlled. They're still quite breathless on exertion, they're still being troubled by palpitations. And, you know, certain drugs such as beta blockers or um, addition of digoxin onto that, these are quite safe drugs. These are drugs that I've used for quite a long time within my career and I feel quite competent in what the pros and the risks are associated with them. So from those patients, it's a bit frustrating because I have to do a quick letter, uh, then contact the GP surgery, fax something through quickly, and then ask the patient to go back to their um, community doctor to change the prescription. So for those patients, I think it would definitely speed up um, their treatment plan and hopefully control their symptoms a lot quicker. I have one or two reservations, and that is because um, I th arrhythmia, there's four drugs that we can use for rhythm control. And they're quite um, important drugs, but they also have a potent, every antiarrhythmic we prescribe has the potential to cause an arrhythmia. And some of them, especially drugs such as um, amiodrum, very good, safe for the heart, but it carries a lot of potential um, side effects. So personally, from my point of view, and this is only my opinion, 
I think even when you know I do get my nurse prescribing, there are certain drugs that I will always discuss with the consultant cardiologist, um, more for my reassurance and also for, for patient safety, that um, I prescribe it in conjunction with the um, support of the consultant cardiologist. And that would be because you hold a master's in cardiology. Yes. That's, um, that's nothing particularly to do with your level of knowledge. I don't I think so. It's, it's about just, what is it? It's a reassurance from other colleagues. Because yeah. Because what you're saying is you're, you're weighing up the pros and cons and it's always good to have mm -hmm. some. Do you think there'll be a point where you are you saying, however knowledgeable and experienced, it's always good to have another opinion? I was quite fortunate in this post when I first started. I was quite fortunate in that part of my training included being allowed to do a clinic alongside a consultant electrophysiologist in King's for and doing that for one day a week for three years. And what I found is that these are the experts within the area. These are the experts when it comes to prescribing antiarrhythmics. And even when they're prescribing it, things can go wrong because these are temperamental medication. And having it was from working with them that I felt that as much as, you know, I know about these drugs, I know what to look out for, I do think that in some ways patient, like I said, it's only my opinion, for the time being I feel that I'm it needs to be discussed with a consultant cardiologist mm -hmm. so you have that extra sort of security because mm -hmm. I'm not sure how protected I would be if something didn't go right with it being an antiarrhythmic and a nurse prescriber. Um, and just finally, what's new? What's, what's, what's new? What's on the horizon um, managing AF? Well, um, straightforward things that can be implemented in a nurse-led um, clinic. I mentioned earlier the uh, European Society of Cardiology. Uh, we manage our atrial fibrillation in um, England and the UK according to this sort of guidance and um, we have been, uh, stroke prevention is one of the most important things when managing atrial fibrillation. We have been in the past few years using a score system called CHADS2 CHADS2. And um, generally speaking, if the CHAD score is two or above, we prescribe an important anticoagulant such as warfarin. That has now been replaced by a CHADS2 VAS score. They've done more research and they found this new scoring system uh, is more, um, it's more accurate when predicting the patient's risk of a stroke. Mm -hmm. And it takes in additional risk factors such as gender, younger age and vascular disease. So that's something that I think is quite important when we're doing a nurse um, leg clinic that we're using scoring systems that are actually advocated by good evidence. Mm -hmm. Uh, another thing which I think is quite beneficial, especially for um, when, we're dis when we're recommending warfarin therapy back to the community doctors, community doctors in the past, and rightly so, they have a large um, group of patients, they're quite worried about the risk of bleeding. The European Society of Cardiology has also now recommended a new scoring system called HASBLED and it gives you a scoring system of risk factors which puts the patient at an increased risk of bleeding and if the patient has a score of three above it's an, um, you should be aware that caution needs to be exerted these patients need to be monitored more closely so that's one thing from the anticoagulation following on from that there's hopefully some new exciting anticoagulant drugs that should be hopefully license for use um, by the NHS next year and one of them is an oral anticoagulant called dabigantran. That is currently under review by the National Institute of Clinical Excellent which is a body that we have within the United Kingdom that has to approve drugs for to be licensed for use within the NHS. That's the National Health Service? Yes. Yeah, yeah. And um, so we're, that's currently under review and they're hoping that guidance will be issued um, in January 2012. Um, the main benefits of this over warfarin is that um, one, the patient doesn't need regular um, um, blood monitoring to see what their levels are. Two, they're supposed to be uh, far less interactions with um, food, other medications and uh, Three, um, it allows the patient to have more freedom. They're not tied to coming to hospital for, you know, um, further 
um, test, blood test. Mm. Uh, slight cautions with it is that um, one is probably going to be more expensive, um, but that would be balanced against anticoagulation monitoring. Mm. Two, it's supposed to cause increased risk of um, dyspepsia. And three, uh, it's not significant, but there has been a slight mention of um, a slight association with an increased risk of uh, myocardial infarction. However, that was not statistically significant. So that's one drug. And the other drug that uh, really that's been kind of highlighted within the last six months is a new antiarrhythmic called Dronedarone. Uh, the brand name I think is generally called Maltac. And this is an antiarrhythmic that was licensed and said to be quite similar to um, Amiodrone, but it didn't have iodine, so less side effects. Um, we have. The National Institute of Clinical Excellence have said that we can use this drug as a second line drug. So you have to try the patient first with something like a beta blockers and the patient must have no evidence of heart failure and ideally um, we should use it for patients with um, paroxysmal or persistent, not for long standing AF. Um, so far when we've used it in patients there has been a caution a couple of months ago that was issued by the company that there was, out of 8,000 patients, they had a record of two having um, developed uh, liver failure. However, this is a small amount, and now if we're issuing this drug, it's very important, if you prescribe you within your clinic, that clear guidance is given to the patient and to the general practitioner that the patient does need blood tests to be done once a month to check their liver function for the first six months, then at nine, and then at 12. But, you know, I've seen a few patients on it and they're going quite well. There hasn't been any problems, thankfully. Okay. Um, just finally, um, any tips, people any setting tips? up a, an AF clinic, uh, um, from your own experience? Yeah. Just some f final points. Okay. Uh, you can't do anything on your own. Uh, first and foremost. Um, in the ideal world you need uh, a good working relationship with your consultant cardiologist, stroke consultant electrophysiologist and you need their support. You also need to have a good working relationship, they're very important, the cardiac physiologist because you access them a lot. You, you know, they're the ones that will provide um, the 24-hour tape monitoring, uh, the echocardiograms, uh, they're the ones if you need your, one of your patients done a little bit more urgently, you know, have a good working relationship with them. And thirdly, and I'm sure every single nurse specialist in the entire UK has said this, but admin support. You know, um, doctors have been trained from a young age, they go in and it's all set up, the clinics, the notes, everything like that. You have to be a strong character and you have to believe that your clinic is just as important in a different way to your consultant's clinic, so therefore you do need good administrative support. Okay, that's and that's it. it? That's it. Lovely. Thanks ever so much, Anne. Okay. Thanks.